Well, good morning. Good morning. All the years that I've done this, I have always felt led to do a word study on the times that cattle is mentioned in the Bible. You know, that's going to take a long time. Cattle is mentioned in the Bible from the very start of the Bible. But I've been led this morning to address uh, some issues about us primarily, about uh, our responsibility as husbandmen. Now, I don't know how many of you here are old enough to have a degree in animal husbandry. Um, they stopped giving out that degree after I left the university in the late 70s because they felt it was too sexist. Sexist? I would say that. I didn't know how to say it. Uh, because it implied that only men took care of livestock, and that is not true. That is absolutely not true. It is a term that refers to anyone that cares for livestock, that has a responsibility of being a steward of the care of livestock. So I want to go through the Bible this morning and look at some of the verses that deal with what is a just husbandman. And we're going to start out pretty quick if you have your Bible with you or have it on your iPad or your iPhone. We're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 and we're going to look at verse 24 to start with. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Do you know what that means? I know that you know, George. That means that like kind begets like kind, right? There are no intermediate stages. I think it was uh, um, Darwin who said, if we don't find any missing links, my theory is totally shot. Well, we haven't found any missing links because there aren't any. It's a matter of statistics, right, George? Genes come in pairs, and you, all, you can only have genetic structure that is in pairs, and so like kind begets like kind. There had to be the original one that was uh, created, and from that point on, his genetic code stays in pairs. Notice what he says, after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you today, this time, this morning, this beautiful day, that you would bless the reading of your word. And Lord, that it would uh, inspire us this morning as we study it. We look at what it contains, its truth. Lord, we ask that you would bless our time together, that your Holy Spirit would have his way here, that only what he once said is what is said. We pray it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Now it is interesting that God created all of these different species. I don't even know how many species there are. We learn all that in zoology, but let me tell you, there are lots of them, and we're still discovering new ones. We have species that have gone extinct. We can find their fossil records. But there are millions of species of life. We classify them in the animal kingdom uh, in various... Uh, well, we have boss indicus, right? We saw that in Brazil last night. Uh, cattle that are bringer origin. And uh, we, we list our species in that manner. Notice that it says that not only did God create the cattle, but he gave dominion to man over the cattle. Now you look that word dominion up. That's quite an interesting word. God has dominion over this world, does he not? He has dominion over his universe. 
The Apostle Paul tells us he has dominion over principalities and powers and dominions, thrones, everything, all in the spirit world and the physical world. But yet do you see that God has given us dominion over the cattle? Now what that really means is we are the Lord's stewards. We are his managers. We are the ranch manager, the farm manager, the livestock manager. Whatever it might be of God's creation that we have in our hands, we are given dominion for it. And with that comes great responsibility. Great responsibility. I would like for you to turn in your Bible, if you would, to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, chapter 26. Now, if you remember your Bible school, right? It's uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. I hope I've got the reference right. I'm not sure it's not 1 Samuel, but I will look here. I want to set up this story. This is a period of time just after. Uh, it is 1 Samuel. I don't know why I have 1 Chronicles. Um, you'll remember the nation of Israel looked around them. They saw all these pagan nations living around them. And uh, they saw that they had uh, it's 2 Samuel. What the heck? They saw that they had... Uh, well, I, I may be completely off base here. I guess I'll just tell you about it. <laughs> it's a very interesting story, wherever it is in here. <laughs> um, Samuel was just anointed Saul as king. And he didn't like it any. He didn't like it at all. You remember that God said, they've not rejected you, Samuel, they've rejected me. You remember that God told them, if I give you a king, he is going to want your handmaidens for his servants. He's going to put your sons in his military. And that's the exactly the very first thing that Saul did. He took all of the men of Israel and stuck them in the army and went to war. And he did. Well, in the process of this, Samuel is speaking to the people and he said, uh, have I done anything to you that has been dishonest have I taken any of your cattle? Have I stolen any of your crops? Have I, uh, have I been sinful? Have I been anything but humble to you? And the people responded, no, you've been just exactly the way you should be. And the point that I want to make from this scripture is that Saul says, have I taken any of your cattle? I want you to know that very early on in biblical history, cattle were a representation of wealth. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Laban, uh, all of these people were wealthy because of the livestock they owned. And Saul wanted to make sure that these people knew that he was speaking the truth to them. He told them that the king was not what God wanted for the land of Israel. He did not want a man to rule over Israel. God wanted to rule over Israel. And if you know anything about biblical history, Saul was a disaster as a king. An absolute disaster. But yet Samuel wanted to make sure that they understood that he obeyed God in every aspect of what God had asked him to do. He had anointed Saul when he didn't want to. And when Saul fell out of favor with God because of the sin that he did in not uh, destroying the Ammonites completely, Saul, or Samuel then anointed David. And you remember what God said about David? He said, he is a man after my own heart. He is a man after my own heart. David wasn't perfect by any means. But uh, do you know what David was doing when he was anointed as king? He was keeping livestock for his father. He was being a steward of what was put in his hands. 
And you remember that he killed a bear and he killed a lion. When it came time to stand up against Goliath, he was not afraid. He was not afraid. So I want you to know that this is an honorable and just profession that we are in, but we are not allowed to disobey what God has directed us to do. Turn with me, if you would, to Jonah chapter 4. And I want to look at verse 11. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Now, set up the story just a little bit for you. You remember God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh. I don't know if you know what Nineveh is, but Nineveh was the seat of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, God was eventually going to use this empire to punish the northern kingdom and take them into captivity. And he did not want Nineveh destroyed. And so he sent Jonah to preach to the king of Nineveh and to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah didn't want to do it. Jonah wanted him destroyed. You remember the story of, of the whale and all of that? Well, this isn't the latter part of the book of Jonah. And this is God arguing with Jonah about whether or not he should actually destroy Nineveh. We're looking at Jonah chapter 4 verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. I found that very interesting. Uh, God had, had uh, great compassion and grace upon the human beings that were in Nineveh, but he also had compassion upon the cattle that were in Nineveh. And I think it demonstrates to us that God loves his creation. God loves cattle. He loves that they are taken care of properly. And he wants us to be the ones that do it and do it properly. Turn back with me, if you would, to the book of Proverbs. I'm going to read you a few verses that are a favorite of mine. We're going to deal here with God's disdain, total disdain, for those that rob the raisers of livestock those that produce the crops that feed the world. And I remember studying this as a kid in Bible school and being uh, very impressed with it, so much so that when I set my scale system up, I made them set it for one pound increments, George, so there wouldn't be any chance that I was shorting anybody on the weights. We have a weights and measures department in every department of agriculture in the United States. And do you know what their job is? to make sure that the measures are correct, that the weights are correct, the volumes are correct. And so I just want to read a few verses to you uh, to show you what God's interest in is in in honor, honorable transaction in agriculture. I'm going to look at Proverbs 11, verse 1. A false balance, no balance of a scale. A false balance is abomination to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. Now, I didn't do as much study on that word abomination, but I'm telling you that is about as strong a language as you're going to get out of the Word of God for what God disdains. Abomination. A false weight. Stealing value. Not being uh, honest in your dealings. It is abomination to the Lord. Abomination. I think that uh, when we take our livestock to market and we're dealing with the packing industry today, they might in fact be giving us a correct weight, but they do not have a level balance. I will assure you of that. They do not have a level of balance. And I want to read a couple other verses to back up what I'm saying. Turn over a little bit further to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 11. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. A just weight and balance all are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are His work. Now, I may be going a little bit off base here, but I, I was inspired 
led to discuss this subject with you today. I want to give you an example of how unjust some of the transactions are we deal with. A few years ago, I fed out a set of fat cattle at home to prove that I could do it. They were good cattle. They're black, white face and black cattle. I had one calf in there that weighed about a little less than a thousand pounds of fat. Uh, the guy I was, was buying from me was taking a broken bow and uh, he said, go ahead and send it, Doc. I think they'll, they'll, they'll take it. So I was just gonna butcher the I sent it and they didn't take it, they docked it. And they docked it significantly because the carcass was so-called underweight. A few weeks after that in my meat plan, I ordered a uh, box of ribeyes. And I believe that cat's ribeye was in that box. <laughs> and I paid just as much for it as I did for the others. That, my friends, is an unjust bounty an unjust weight, an un a dishonest businessman, a dishonest practice. And I can tell you the Lord frowns on it dramatically. I know you all have similar stories. Uh, we see it every time we almost send a load of cattle in. Let's skip over to Luke 17, if you would, with me. Luke chapter 17. And I want to look at uh, verse 7. And this is the Lord speaking himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, about that James, will say unto him, by and by, and when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat. And he is telling a story here of, uh, uh, um, an actual agricultural event. He said when the servant comes in the field, he's supposed to fix you a meal. You got to go fix him. And uh, he's saying that there is a structure in life. That there is a pattern that is generally adhered to. And yet, he says that uh, the meat shall inherit the earth. That we're to have a humble attitude. We're to have a humble uh, Personality, we're to have grace on people. We're to think of others greater than ourselves, the Apostle Paul said. Consider others greater than yourself. Now, he tells uh, in Galatians, I believe, that we ought not to think too highly of ourselves. And in that respect, our, our purpose, our desire should be that we are honest and just in all that we do, even if it hurts us to some extent. But I want you to notice that even the Lord Jesus Christ understands the process that we are in in agriculture. He understands that it is a responsibility we have to feed cattle, to take care of our crops, um, to take care and be stewards of those things that are in our responsibility. And then if you would turn to Jeremiah, Chapter 17, I know I got you jumping back and forth a little bit. You can play like you're in a Bible drill. Jeremiah 17, verse 11. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatches them not, so he that getteth riches and not by the right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. Well, Jeremiah has put it in pretty plain language that being dishonest, being uh, not correct, being uh, a person who tries to take advantage of others in business makes you a fool. That those riches will not last. You do understand that there is a day of judgment. There is a time when Christ will make all things right. I'm not saying that it's our responsibility to wait for that day. That's the whole purpose of what our calf is, right? Our responsibility is to fight. Look at our look at our motto, fighting for the U.S. cattle producer, fighting for sheep producers, fighting for livestock producers, fighting for all of us in agriculture, really. All of us. 
And yet, there are a lot that supposedly represent agriculture that are part of the unrighteous and dishonest and unequal weight system that we got to operate in today. It can be in many, many ways that we are robbed of our income. You remember Christ said himself that the workman is worthy of his hire and that the first fruits of the farmer, which go to the Lord, the farmer is to receive the profit from that point forward. That is biblical. That is what is right. That's what's just. That's what's honest. That's liberty in reality. Liberty. We uh, don't have that today in the livestock market. I'm not here as an economist. I'm not here as a geopoliticist. But I can tell you, there ought to be a rocket scientist. You get old hillbilly from the Ozarks and understand that what we're dealing with today is not right and not just. It's not right. Well, let's, tur let's turn and read uh, in the New Testament, and I will close this morning. I want to look at Romans chapter 12. You remember that it is the book of Romans that uh, convinced Martin Luther that justification in Christ was what brings salvation. You remember that Martin Luther said Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, and foundationally changed uh, Christianity worldwide. This book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, we're going to read a few words that he has written. Romans 12, Romans 12, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now what does Paul mean when he says, rather give place to wrath? He is saying that it is God's job to elicit justice. It is God's job to bring about justice. That he will bring about justice. But it is also our responsibility to stand for what is right. There are things that we are dealing with in this nation today that are not right. We have states that have passed laws that allow little babies to be murdered to the, up until the time of birth, and the legislators on one side of the aisle get up and clap and cheer when the governor signs the darn thing. You think maybe God's judgment might be in action today? I certainly do. You cannot wave at God and not expect Him to seek what is right and just. His responsibility is to be a just judge, no matter what the circumstances. And it never is going to change. You cannot make God's justice adapt to the time. You cannot make God's justice adapt to your politics. You can make, cannot make God's justice adapt to what you want it to be. It's what the Bible says it is. And that's never going to change. I preached a sermon here just a few uh, weeks ago at a church I was raised in. I said President Trump got in trouble for saying it is what it is. Well, that Bible is what it is. And there is nothing going to change it. Nothing. I don't care what you think. It is what it is. And God is going to give us justice. may not be exactly in the time span that we want it to be in may not even be in our lifetimes, but we're to work for it, we're to strive for it, we're to seek it, we're to do like Samuel did, we're to make sure they understand what justice actually is, what right actually is. Uh, we have a government that is supposed to stand up for justice, it's supposed to advocate for liberty, and yet we see that it is not doing the job that's been assigned not doing the job that's been assigned. Did we not learn that yesterday about the Department of Justice? Did we not learn that they are not doing the job assigned them? They're allowing things to occur and go on in marketing, um, in procurement. Really almost unbelievable. 
for this time, time span that we are in today. I'm not going to go into the history of a lot of things that uh, my family were involved in, in back in the 20s, but I have a letter in my family Bible that my grandfather wrote to our representative in the state of Missouri concerning the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921. And that representative has written me back and said, Mr. Thornsbury, we are addressing your concerns and we should have a consent decree and we should have a new law that will go into place called the Packers and Stockyards Act. And it has been castrated. I know no other better word to use. It has been castrated. It has been emasculated. It has been destroyed. The intent of that law that my great-grandfather sought and worked so hard to get passed is destroyed. Literally destroyed. Now, I don't know what we can do about that. I know one thing that uh, we need a new Secretary of Agriculture. That's one thing I know. We need someone that advocates for agriculture, advocates for producers, that advocates for us who are husbandmen, who take care of livestock, who take care of the farm, who grow the crops, who buy those new tractors out there and new shoots. Um, I know that's what we need. And that's what I pray for, but there's more required than prayer, there is action. If you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Now ladies, please don't get mad at me when I read what is in the word in black and white. Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any other such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now I want to close at the reading of that scripture this morning and that our responsibility as men and women that care for livestock is also for our family also for those that we are going to raise up that are going to be the next generation to come along I look out over this room today and I see many many young faces when this thing started there wasn't a half a dozen young faces it was all old people like me and uh, we're going to leave this in your hands someday. I am sorry that we have not been more successful than we have, but we've had successes. But I can tell you one thing that we are going to leave you with. We're going to leave you with a spirit of fighting for what is right. We're going to leave you with the understanding that RCAS stands for what is just and honest. And I'm going to tell you that that is a biblical principle that we will never withdraw from. We will never withdraw from. I remember when we changed our motto from working to fighting that we had people that were really upset about that. That's just too strong. You can't be strong enough in the day that we live in today. You cannot be strong enough. And I leave you this morning with this. We are just husbands.